Good afternoon. I'm Christine Taylor Lewis. And on behalf of the Afro-American Historical Association of Pawkeya County, I thank you for joining us and welcome you to this, our 23rd, in a series of conversations with family historians and others who share their genealogy research or provide information related to local African-Americans and their history. We at AAHA are committed to collecting, documenting, preserving, and sharing US history with a special interest in the African-American experience in Fort Care and neighboring counties. So we hope that these virtual events will remind you of the richness of our history and our culture, and that they will encourage you to visit our website at aahafortcare.org. The AAHA webpage is an exceptional online resource for searching and collecting historical data, including rare books and special publications, antique photographs, and an assortment of records and documents of interest to local genealogy and history buffs. The website also provides a virtual tour of the AAHA Museum in the Plains and an interactive story map of the history of Fauquier County's African-American communities, churches, and schools. In addition, there are links to, the, to our digital map center to the Morgantown School Project, as well as local news stories about AAHA's involvement in the community. And of course, there are connections to various social media outlets. So visit us at aaha4care.org. We also invite you to our Facebook page each Thursday for a brief history of the African-American schools in Fauquier County. Each week, we highlight one of 40 schools that served the community prior to integration in the 1960s. Now, over the past several months, these postings have generated a steady stream of visitors, some of whom have made significant contributions to our data pool. So do take a look at our Facebook posting, especially on Thursdays. Now, Today, we are absolutely honored to be joined by our two guests, both of whom have a special interest in children's literature, and both of whom have been published. One of them will talk to us about the perspective, um, or from the perspective of an author, and the other from the point of view, if you will, of an illustrator. These young women are truly gifted in their creative abilities and have been an inspiration to many children, I'm sure. As a matter of fact, I was telling them both that I sent their books um, that they're gonna talk about today to my two little nieces in Michigan. And they were absolutely thrilled just looking at the little girls on the covers. So I have no doubt that they will be equally inspired what they find inside. And so will other little girls and little boys as well. Now, our first guest is Laurie Smith Jackson. I met her in the early 1990s when I first became part of the long and well-established fellowship between her church, which is the Mount Olive Baptist Church in Rectortown, and mine, which is the Mount Pisgah Baptist in Upperville. Laurie Smith Jackson was born in Washington, D.C. and raised in Gainesville, Virginia. She graduated from George Mason University in Fairfax with a degree in communication. She has been employed with the city of Manassas Department of Social Services for 28 years. Laurie and her husband, Bruce, are the proud parents of five daughters, Lauren, Samantha, Corin, Elizabeth, and Renee. And she is overjoyed to be the honey to her four grandchildren, Hazel, Micah, Sydney, 
and Kalia. Laurie has been writing since she was a teen. She also loves arts and crafts, reading and singing, and she does have a beautiful voice. So hello, Laurie. Hello, Mrs. Lewis. Thank you. And welcome, and I thank you so much for joining us today. For me, it's an absolute honor and a delight. It, it truly is. So uh, we have a lot to cover. So are you ready to uh, talk a little? I am, and I just want to say thank you so much for this opportunity. I really appreciate it. Okay, good. It's just a joy, such a joy to have you with us. Now, first of all, um, what actually inspired you to begin writing when you were a teenager? Well, actually, I feel like I was actually forced to write as a teenager. Oh, yeah. Um, in high school, we were required to keep a journal daily, and I really didn't appreciate it or like it, but I did it. And um, when I got into college, of course, you have to do a lot of writing in college. Um, one of my English professors really encouraged me. She told me I was a good writer. And from that point, I started to really enjoy it. So I actually didn't start enjoying writing until I was in my 20s, even though I had been writing since I was a teen. Okay, so primarily you were forced to do it. But once <laughs> you got involved with it, you did so well that um, it encouraged you or you were yes. encouraged by your teachers to go on. Yes, ma'am. When I had more freedom to write what I wanted to write about, I, mm -hmm. I really started to enjoy it more. Okay. So um, when you were a teen and uh, forced to write, was there a particular book or author that um, you turned to or that you might have enjoyed? Oh, absolutely. Um, in high school, I, I've always loved to read. That was one thing that I've always loved to do was okay. to read. And when I was in high school, me and um, two of my friends, we had a book club and our favorite author was Maya Angelou. Maya. And we always shared um, all of her books and would have our discussions about them amongst the three of us. So she was my favorite author as a teen. Wonderful, that's wonderful. And you had an opportunity to see her you know, through the airwaves for many, many years. Oh, absolutely, yes. I still enjoy it. Even books that I've read before, you find something new when you read them again. So I still enjoy reading her books. That's true. She's just a wealth of, of wisdom and creativity. So do you have a favorite author today? Or well, my favorite author today is actually J. California Cooper. Okay. Um, she passed away a few years ago, but her stories are so simplistic, but oh. they have such rich stories and rich um, ideas. They're very inspiring and they're just um, very warm and heartfelt stories. And I really enjoy her books. Good. It sounds like she probably influenced you quite a bit. Yes, ma'am, yes. So, okay, let's talk about your recently published book. Mm -hmm. Valencia and the Velvet Dress, yes, ma'am. <laughs> yes, Valencia. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, what prompted you to write Valencia in the Velvet Dress? Actually, um, the story of Valencia came to me on a car ride. Hmm. I was driving with my daughters and I was very tired and felt very sleepy. And I decided to tell them the story to keep myself engaged and keep myself awake. And the story came to me and it was, it just rolled right through me, I, I can't really explain it. It was almost as, I always say God gave me the story because the way it just came to me, um, just all of the details were there. And the next day, oh, I'll even say, well, by the time we got home, my daughters wanted me to continue telling the story because they were so engaged. So the next day I decided to write it down. And so that was about 20 years ago, <laughs> or maybe 24 years ago, actually. And I had shared the story with some of my family members and they always encouraged me to get it published, but I was just so busy taking care of my children and working that I really didn't have an opportunity to dedicate the time to it um, when I first wrote it. Okay, so um, actually you wrote the story in your heart long before you published it and it was well known by your family yes, and children. Yes, the the um the majority of the story was written um in that car ride, um, oh. and then 
recently, you know, I added to the story. And of course, when you're publishing, your publisher always wants you to expound or expand. So I did expand parts of the story um, while it was being published in the process of being published. That's wonderful. That's awesome. It's a beautiful story. So I'm uh, looking at the um, beautiful cover. It's just mm -hmm. um, vivid and colorful. It's a pretty little girl. Did um, you take part in choosing who the illustrator was? Yes, ma'am, I did. I picked her. Um, she had illustrated uh, another children's book for my publisher. And I saw her illustrations and I just loved how she made those characters come to life on the page. And I asked my publisher if they would reach out to her to see if she was available to publish Valencia. And she agreed, they sent her the story and she agreed to um, illustrate it. And I just gave her basic descriptions of what everyone in the book would look like. And she took exactly what I had in mind and put it on paper and they came out just as I had imagined them. And I, I absolutely love them. That's an excellent choice um, that you made. The images, as I said earlier, they're so vivid and alive, as you mentioned. And, and the, the characters actually okay. look like members of your family. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, and that's just a coincidence because she actually lives in Ghana. Is so, that right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so you know anything about me or my family and I just I guess I envisioned the, the way I had envisioned her I guess was like my own daughters and that's how it came out to be that way yes well they certainly look like your family members uh, thank you so uh how long did it take you to to write this book well once I got involved um with the publisher that whole process um, took about six months from me to, once I submitted the story to them and they accepted it and then worked with my artistic director and my production assistant on getting the story um, polished and finished. It took about six months. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. You know, when you think about publishing mm -hmm. and to know that um, you already had the story, it seems that everything just fell right into place for you. It did. It did. The, the publisher actually is in Herndon, Virginia, and I had heard of them through um, going to a, another local book author's event, and that's mm -hmm. how I found the publisher. Okay. So, um, as you were talking, I was about to ask if Valencia was modeled after anyone you know, but I would imagine um, it would be your daughters or granddaughters. Or... Yeah, I, I guess that's just a coincidence. Um, her personality is all an imagine a figment of my imagination. She's born in my imagination. So there's really nothing about her that is exactly like anyone in my family, but I guess bits and pieces of her are. I'm sure, I'm sure. Many traces of you. <laughs> so um, I noticed in, at the end of each uh, chapter or section in the book, there's a, an exercise mm -hmm. activity. So um, what made you think to do that or inspired you or had you seen that somewhere else? I had not seen that, um, but when my children were in school, I'm not sure which daughter, but they had a teacher that whenever they read a story, she asked them to either change the ending or add their own pictures. And mm -hmm. that wasn't my intention in the beginning, but when I got my pre-production copy, at the end of each chapter, it was just a plain page. And I just didn't like that. And so I asked the publisher, could we put a little activity at the end of each chapter? And they agreed and it worked out perfect. It did, it certainly did. It made me smile, you know, I wanted to take part myself. <laughs> <laughs> well then, um, would you mind reading an excerpt from Valencia in the Velvet Dress and explain um, a particular point that you want to get across? Okay, certainly. Okay. I'll pull up the screen um, for the page that you told me. This is from chapter four, Potter's Pets. And I will add that the name Potter came from a former coworker of mine. She was um, a really good friend, well, still is a really good friend. And she was actually the first person I knew that had a pet that was actually a part of their family. Mm -hmm. the, her pet received Christmas gifts and birthday gifts and 
birthday cake. <laughs> so <laughs> I knew how much she loved pets and that's why I named the pet store after her. Okay. Valencia could hardly talk because she was so excited. She said, mom, I have something to ask you, but before you say no, but she spoke with such speed that, that Valerie only heard mom, blah, 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 blah. Valencia, slow down. What are you saying? Valencia took a deep breath and started it again. Mom, I have something to ask you, but before you say no, hurry and say it, Valencia. This water is running down my back, Valerie said. Can I get a dog? I mean, can we get a dog, me and Coco? It won't cost anything except for the food and maybe a leash, but I can probably make a leash and Coco has a big backyard for it to play in. Where is this free dog? We saw the sign in the window at the pet store. I promise to take care of it and I'll train it and teach it tricks. Honey, I know you've always wanted a pet and I'm sure you would take good care of it, but I'm not so sure that now is a good time for us to get a new pet. Your father and I were going to talk to you this evening about your grandmother, Granny Lolly, coming to stay with us for a while. So right now might not be the best time to get a pet, but we're going to be out of town for a bit, getting Lolly moved from her house to home, from her home to ours. I'm sorry, honey, maybe next year. Valencia dropped her head and walked out of the salon. The only thing that made her feel better was knowing that Granny Lolly would be living with them. She loved Granny Lolly. They were basically best friends. Valencia went to look for Coco, who she found leaning against Aunt Becky's car. Valencia ran up to Coco and said, so what did she say? Can I get one? Coco looked at Valencia with a side glance and her arms folded and said in a whiny voice, no, Trey has allergies. Allergies? I thought he was just allergic to flowers and trees. Well, apparently he's allergic to a lot of things, including dogs. I asked my mom if we could get it and keep it outside. She said no, because the dog hair can come inside and it wouldn't be fair to Trey to have to stay inside all the time. Then I said, well, what if we keep the dog inside and Trey can live outside? <laughs> my mom didn't think that was very funny. I told her it wasn't fair and that Trey ruins everything. Then she went into the salon and I've been waiting out here for you. I'm so mad, what did your mom say? Well, Trey can't help it, and no, I can't get one either. But I do have some good news. My Granny Lolly is going to be living with us for a while. Coco lifted and lowered her hands like she was weighing something and said, hmm, cute puppy or granny that makes the best cupcakes and homemade ice cream in the world? Puppy, granny, puppy, granny. Okay, I'll take Granny Lolly too, but I still want a dog. <laughs> That's absolutely awesome. That's so beautiful. Thank you. It's well described and it's relatable. Um, so what is it that made you decide to predict that particular um, section? Well, um, I suppose just that all children want a dog. Every little kid that sees a dog wants a dog. <laughs> and so many children um, don't want Oh, I'm sorry, want to have dogs, but aren't able to have dogs. And so in, the, in this chapter, um, the reason that they are at the pet store is because they volunteer at the pet store taking care of the pets. So that was an alternative to not having their own pet. They can go and take care of the different pets at the store. And then you bring out the idea of volunteering. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And ties into the work ethic and giving back to the community or giving Absolutely. to the community. Absolutely. Volunteering is, it makes you a well-rounded citizen. I myself volunteer um, at the Hilton Performing Arts Center oh in my supposed free time. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I feel like um, giving back to your community is very important um, to be a full citizen and a full participant in your community. And you always have a few minutes to help, to lend a hand or to just spend time doing things that you love because being at the Performing Arts Center, I get to always also see shows. So it's sort of a win-win situation. Mm -hmm. That's a wonderful thing. I, I really enjoyed that, um, what you pulled out because it's funny, um, it's easy to follow and um, the imagination just flows with you and you get a, a real good sense of hello Valencia and her little friend. And everybody should have a granny lolly. 
Yes. Yeah. Everybody <laughs> should, you know, many of us do or did. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. It's a Very special heart one. Yeah. This is the rest of the book. Thank um, you. So um, what in general would you like children to take away from reading Valencia and the Velvet Jess? I would like for children and actually anyone, because even though it's a children's story, it is a good story. Even adults will enjoy it. Um, and it just tells you basically to not judge people by how they look on the outside. Their outward appearance is not who they are. What they wear does not make them who they are. So whether they are wearing um, clothes that are tattered or dirty or the same thing over and over, it doesn't necessarily dictate who they are as a person. And you have to get to know someone um, personally to really find out what type of person they are and who they are. That's true. That's so true. And um, I, I like the idea, which is very true, that if an adult can enjoy a children's book, then it's truly very well written and it's a, a good book. Thank and, uh, you. Yeah, that's the mark of, of determining what a good, a good children's book, especially. So yes. I appreciate those comments. But um, while you were writing about um, Valencia, did you do anything in particular to help you to stay focused? Well, actually, it was very arduous for me. <laughs> I had a lot <laughs> going on in my life at the same time. And I was like, why did I decide to do this now? I just have so much going on. And there were days when I didn't want to look at it again. I said, I, ca I can't read the story one more time. I've got to put it down. And that was the best way for me to deal with it. Um, and then after a couple of days, I was like, okay, you've got to do it. And then one weekend, um, I was close to the end, very close to the end. And my um, editor had sent me the final edits. And I just sat down in my chair for probably five or six hours and just did the whole thing. I said, <laughs> put it down, picking up, put it down. I just did it. I said, I'm going to finish today. I was just determined today's my last day. I'm not going to look at it anymore <laughs> after today because it, it was long and arduous. Um, just, you know, having to reread the story every time, just looking for mistakes or typos or just to make sure it was consistent and how the, the timeline was because Sometimes I had, I did have a part where the, the timeline was off. So I had to go back to fix that. And it was, it was very um, painstaking, but I'm so happy with how it turned out. So I'm glad that I put that effort into it because the end result is, it's just a wonderful story. And I'm just so happy with it. It is, it truly, it truly is. So um, have you published any other books? I have not published any other books. I am in the process. Um, I've written a poetry book hmm. and it's ready to go. I'm just um, waiting to make that final push to get it published. Um, and then I'm also in the process of writing a novel as well hmm. as the continuation of Valencia's story with her friends. Oh, my. So you're working on a novel. Have you been doing that for a while? Or? I've been working on the novel for, um, I hate to say, probably 10 years. Yes, ma'am. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. So I know you, um, I can tell, and I just know from knowing you that I've um, seen you, you know, around the church um, circles, if you will, the things that go on, that you're very meticulous and you like things just so, and your voice and, and the things that you do have to be just right. So, uh, <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised at all. And that's also, in my opinion, what makes one excellent writer. You know, it takes time, it takes energy, and it really takes um, putting your heart and soul into it, just like you did when you started writing about Valencia. So I certainly uh, look forward to that if I'm still around, and I probably will be. <laughs> so I hope it doesn't take me another 20 years. <laughs> I will. It probably will. <laughs> So then, uh, Laurie, what advice would you give to a writer who's working on their first um, children's book, if any? 
Yeah. Um, my advice would be to just write this whenever you have time, whenever, even if it's only for 10 or 15 minutes at a time to just always write and to always have um, something that you can put your notes down on with you wherever you go, because you never know when you might be inspired for a part of your story or an illustration for your story or for even um, a topic or a twist on your story. And just like I had done before, if you just get overwhelmed and tired, put it away for a while and come back to it. Beautiful. Then um, Valencia, as I was reading through it, I can see that it offers um, so many valuable life lessons for young children. So I was wondering, as you mentioned that you want to um, continue the story, um, is there a particular theme that you might uh, want people to identify with you as a, a children's book author, you know, as you go along with well, Valencia? I just want to write stories for African-American youth because when you go to the stores or the libraries, you don't see as many. And my next story actually will be for boys because there are not very many um, stories for young boys to read. Um, and hopefully it'll be an exciting adventure for little boys because little boys are way more adventurous than little girls. I, at least my grandson is way more adventurous than my granddaughters. So I, I wanted to have some action in it. <laughs> Actually, as I was um, approaching the end of the book, I was hoping, I was hoping that you might write about a little boy. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> so I wish you Kelly, the very best. Joseph Kelly will be the star of the next book. Who's that, Kelly? Joseph Kelly Hunter. Yes, right, Joseph Kelly, right, look you bye. <laughs> so um, I think we might have covered it, but I was gonna ask if you had interest in publishing another genre such as romance, mystery, religion, documentary, or whatever. So you do plan to do a novel while well, working on one. I have, I have so many interests. Um, I wanna write about so many different things. So just finding the time to, to do it is my goal. And so um, I just try whenever I have a time, have time to just write, jot down my ideas and write down my ideas. And hopefully I can get them all to come together in one cohesive book. <laughs> you will, you've done so well so far. <laughs> Thank you. So um, I'm going, I put up your um, contact information. You can be emailed at lauriejacksonwrites at gmail.com. And you can be found on Facebook and Instagram at stories by Laurie. So where can the book be purchased? Or Okay, um, you can get it from Amazon, um, Barnes and Noble, Target, or Walmart, all online. Or if you just Google Valencia and the Velvet Dress, all of the places that you can purchase it will come up. I also will be doing a book signing on February the 11th at Barnes and Noble in Manassas from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. And they'll have books there for purchase. And if you see me out and about, I always have books for purchase with me. So. Yeah. <laughs> I put autographs. I put autographs. As I said, my niece was just so excited to see your signature. Yes, thank you. It was so kind of you to autograph your book. Appreciate you. So, um, Laurie, I want to thank you so, so very much uh, for taking the time to be with us today. Because I know, I just know from knowing you that you're a very busy person. And uh, I appreciate that that you're here, you know, to talk to us about your book and other things, just to share with us. And um, Valencia and the Velvet Dress is truly, truly a delightful story about the daily life of a well-balanced, curious little girl um, who is, in many ways, like uh, our daughters and our granddaughters, and like we used to be. So it's very relatable. And in keeping with the times. So again, I commend you and, and congratulate you on the success so far. Um, it was only published in November. I remember 
um, when I engaged you, I made sure I ordered it and uh, it was waiting for me um, at Amazon. And as soon as it came out, I received two copies. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm very grateful. So um, thank you again for joining us. And uh, we hope that um, we'll be able to host you again when your novel comes out. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> I really, really appreciate the opportunity. Thank you to Karen and the board at AAHA. I absolutely am so grateful for the opportunity. And I look forward to participating in more events as a viewer as well as a, um, a participant. Thank you so much. You're so very, very welcome. I mean, truly, truly thank you again. Thank you. So our next guest, is like family. Actually, I met her and her mother before they were even born. She has deep roots in the Haiti community where I grew up. So some of her ancestries know, knew me even before I was born. So we, we truly go back. We truly go back. Ashley Corinne Webb was born in Warrington and attended Fort Care County Schools. She has a bachelor's degree from Virginia Commonwealth University. Ashley became interested in doing illustrations for children's books when she realized that she could serve the youth with art. When a publisher reached out to her to illustrate Layla's Happiness, which is the winner of the 2020 Ezra Jack Keats Award, then the door to children's books opens for her. Ashley hopes to uh, shine light on the small moments that bring us joy and connections that fill us with life. She enjoys dancing, the outdoors, and spending time with her family. Hi, Ashley. Hello, <laughs> how are you? <laughs> I'm doing well, and I welcome you as well. And uh, thank, you. thank you so very much for being with us today, because I know that you too have a, a very busy schedule. It's a so, pleasure to uh, be here, thank you. This is an awesome treat. So uh, are you ready to talk a little? Yes, I'm excited. Good, good. <laughs> So um, explain to all of us what an illustrator does and the difference between an illustrator and a painter or an artist. Okay, so I had to really think about this question uh, and I even Googled. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was, just wanted to make sure, I guess I, presented this the right way, and maybe there is no right way. I'd mm -hmm. say they're all artists, illustrators and painters are both artists. Um, as an illustrator, I've always, and my personal, you know, uh, definition, I guess I'll say is, I've felt like, you know, you're usually creating with pencil, graphite, charcoal, maybe okay. there's digital illustration, um, something like um, that type sort of medium. And then a painter would be uh, using paints, oil paints and things like that. And the ideas that you express uh, in my time as an illustrator, I mean, now I'm doing children's books, but I've done more, I'll say editorial work where I'm illustrating concepts and ideas. And I think mm -hmm. painters can do both of those things too. So mm -hmm. I feel like um, we can express ourselves in similar ways and then different ways. Illustrators and painters can be more, you know, come from your own self-expression uh, or it could be given an idea and how do you see it from your perspective or point of view and people will come to you for that. So it's important to have your own personal perspective. That's right. And when you show it and people recognize it, then that's when they come to you and say, yes. Yeah. So you just, you mentioned tools. What special mm -hmm. tools do you use like charcoal or yeah. Did you prefer? So, mm -hmm. so I'll usually hand draw something first, scan it in, and then I'll do digital illustration. Um, I'll say like my mom, she was, she used charcoal, she painted. Um, she had this amazing boutique in our house. 
Um, but yeah, my preference now is digital. It's a little bit faster, but I do miss uh, more, you know, using my hands. Uh, I'll call that more traditional <laughs> techniques mm-hmm. because being in front of screens all day, you know, that can be a lot sometimes. So I hope to transition back, but right now this is what's working for me. Okay. And, and do you mean um, being in front of a screen on your job or just your normal illustrations? So for doing the illustration. So yeah, I'll scan it into my computer and I use Photoshop. And Photoshop has lots of brushes that imitate different mediums. So I kind of go towards something that feels kind of like crayons or chalk. Um, Mm -hmm. Something that has like an organic texture to it. That's what I prefer. Okay. So you did mention your mother, Sherry Mm -hmm. Carter of Mm -hmm. Sherry Scott on Main Street. And I just know from myself personally that um, she's a gifted illustrator in her own right. And also your grandmother, Eva Jenkins Walker, was uh, very artistic and creative as well. So it's definitely in your genes. But I was wondering, when did you first realize that you either caught the bug or inherited the gift to share your own creative abilities, you know, on a broader scale? Yeah. In other words, uh, when did you say, not like this? Mm-hmm. You know, I do this too. Yeah. So, I mean, I was always, I remember in kindergarten, teachers would kind of like get excited about what I was making. And my mom told me that, you know, that she kept that in my head as I got older, because of course I wasn't aware. But I think definitely in high school, um, I had a teacher, Mr. Colson, um, who mentioned to me, you know, he said, you really do have a gift. Um, mm-hmm. And I thought that always stuck with me because he didn't have to do that. Um, and he told my mom, <laughs> she really does have a gift that's worth pursuing. And my mom always encouraged it. So I did, uh, I remember I did a camp in high school. It was like, I'll call it art camp. And then I went to VCU and did a summer intensive. And that's when, that was bef- when I was choosing like what college to go to. And if I really did want to pursue art. Mm-hmm. So I think I just found confidence probably in 11th grade, 10th, oh. 11th grade. And that's when I was like, okay. Um, I think this is something I can pursue. That's beautiful, Ashley, absolutely beautiful. So um, how are you influenced by your mother's creativity or even your grandmother's legacy as artistic women? Um, Did they influence you directly? Uh, Probably by, I know your mother, by just encouraging you along the way. Is it something that they did? Mm-hmm. You know, and being so, creative that you picked up. Yeah. So yeah. like um as you're speaking, I have things popping up in my head. But um so mom always encouraged creating. Um our I'll say our bathrooms. She would write, I remember she wrote the lyrics of Kirk Franklin's uh, stomp as a border uh-huh. across our bathroom. And we had like a yellow uh-huh. bathroom. And then she let me paint flowers on my wall like a flower border around my room um in her bedroom I remember so she would take me back to her the house she grew up in she drew like um she painted Stevie Wonder on her wall (laughs) and things like that or she'd share her sketchbooks with me and like so I got to see what she did and so I just feel like she was always kind of like she was an example because she was living out her art in different ways and wasn't like hiding it um, or anything like that. And then she was allowing me to express that in different ways too, that I felt like, you know, other, maybe other people didn't have that opportunity, but I felt like really grateful that I got to paint on my wall. <laughs> oh my God, and like that. <laughs> so, and let's stay up there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, um, yeah. And then with grandma, so I never met grandma. So I just, Uh, I've only known her through stories Um, and I think that says so much and has inspired my maybe persistence in pursuing what's on my heart because because people can tell me so many stories and I have a almost I can't say a full image of who she is but it feels pretty full to me 
I just maybe now know like if you do put yourself out into the world however you desire to your community um then I don't know it, it really does leave an impact and that's what I want to do so it maybe encourages me to just like step out of fear to just do what I feel like is on my heart oh how wonderful and your mother does have a unique style that identifies with her mm -hmm. and her creativity as you said earlier and you do look like Miss Eva I guess you hear that a lot but you look a lot like your grandmother, so I'm yeah. not surprised. And that's, that's quite a blessing, it truly really is. So um, tell us, oh yeah, you won the 2020 Ezra Jack Keats Illustrator Award for this picture book that was written by Mariah Hadessa Aquiri Tali. A Kiri Tally, yep. Kiri, <laughs> it's a name. Yep, that's her name. It was illustrated by yourself, and it's mm -hmm. called Layla's Happiness. And let's see if I can pull that up. Mm -hmm. I'm pressing myself. There it is, Layla's Happiness. Yeah. So, tell us a little about Ezra Jack Keats. And what it was like for you to receive the award? So if you all have heard the book Snowy Day, that's the book that Ezra Jack Keats illustrated. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I will share like, just like quick facts that I found because I felt mm -hmm. like I wanted to make sure I was true to um, the right information. So he was a child of a Polish Jewish immigrant um, mm -hmm. and famous for introducing multicultural children's books into American children's literature. Um, one thing it said was he believed that all children should be able to see themselves in the books they love. And in 1962, he wrote the color or he broke the color barrier with the mainstream success of the snowy day. And so that's who he is. And so the Ezra, Ezra Jack Keats Award comes from, I think it's the Ezra Jack Keats maybe foundation, but um, they created, uh, this was uh, created in his honor. And there's like a yearly award that goes out to an illustrator and an author. Um, that had created books in the last year. And it's usually a new illustrator, a new author. Oh, that's absolutely wonderful. So mm -hmm. um, you said he broke the color barrier. Was that by uh, having the character of the little boy in the story day uh, being uh, a person of color? Yes. Uh, he, uh, he would, I mean, most of his books that I am familiar with, he ha he would have uh, black characters, black children as his main characters. Something that uh, was unique to me as I would, you know, as I search for inspiration and in artists, and then also just the types of stories he would tell too, just felt like natural, like everyday life experiences, and he it wasn't trying to make anything like. Uh, <laughs> And he like create this idea or go, fall into like the idea of, uh, you know, coming from suffering or coming from, you know, like that those sort of, he wasn't going on with those ideas. He was just saying mm -hmm. with a snowy day, this is a little black boy enjoying the snow. And I just thought that I always think that's, that's beautiful yeah. and yeah. inspires, you know, um, you know, if someone approaches me with a manuscript, I, I, you know, I'm like, can I make this a black character? Because I, you know, I, you want to show the world that we have these experiences too, That's you know. Right. So. <laughs> these gifts, uh, what an awesome tribute to him, what it mm -hmm. is. So how are you selected to be the illustrator for Our Latest Happiness? So I guess it was in 2017. Um, okay, so I, I posted my work on this website. It was called Women Who Draw. And it, it was basically, a female artists registry of illustrators. Oh. Um, it was during a time when I was, I thought I was gonna pursue illustration full time and then some things happened in life where I was like, okay, just kidding, I have to go back to work. <laughs> so um, I, I was like, let me post my work to this site and just see what happens. Months later, someone approached me, maybe July of 2017. Um, and that was the publisher of Enchanted Lion Books to illustrate mm -hmm. the book. And they found me on that registry. Um, and that was, I guess, the start of my career. 
um, and children's books. Mm -hmm. So um, tell me what it was like to work with the author when um, you did your illustrations for this. Or did mm -hmm. you, I would imagine you did work closely together. Yeah, we work very closely together. And what I've learned in my time now is that every publisher is different and every experience creating a book is different too. Um, uh, Claudia, sorry, her name's Claudia, but she was great. She's very, um, she is very into ensuring that the artist's expression is fully there and will mm -hmm. give it all the time that it needs to make sure it's expressed in the right way. I think in like, sometimes what I was nervous of, and maybe that this is imposter syndrome is mm -hmm. almost leaning towards how other people illustrate and not trusting like, okay, this person, these, they came to me for a reason. So um, I felt like in working with her, I learned to trust what I have to offer. Um, mm -hmm. And she made sure to bring that out too. Um, and then in most books, I don't communicate with the writer directly. Um, but with Layla's happiness, uh, Akiri and I were pretty close and we talked often because I just wanted to make sure the character she had was exactly what, how she envisioned it too. Oh, that's so beautiful. It sounds like she's a real encourager and, um, she wanted to make sure that you were confident, you know, in, in your own insight. So that was, sounds like an excellent relationship. Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, um, of growth. Mm -hmm. So among all of the illustrations that you created for um, this book, we're going to take a look at your favorites. I think. There it is. Yes. So share with us why you like this illustration the most of all the pages in, in your book. Okay. So oh, this is... Beautiful. Oh, thank you. <laughs> this one was was is my favorite, maybe because it was also the most challenging for me. Because um, I am um, one challenge for me is creating scenes like an environment, like a. Um, so this is supposed to take place in a farmer's market, and Layla's expressing how she enjoys um, taking the vegetables she's grown in her garden, in the community garden, to the farmer's market and selling them. But um, just kind of exploring how I envision an environment. Uh, I usually like to like simplify things, but also find where I want to make sure those de certain details are included. I think where I enjoy detail is like uh, the characteristics of people, mm -hmm. uh, the way they move their body, <laughs> yeah. um, what they're wearing, uh, right. what they're doing. So maybe I put more emphasis on the, all the different types of people you might see in this space. And it does take place in New York City. So you just see the little um, idea of a city in the background, I'll say. Mm -hmm. And there's Layla on the bottom right with her mom and they're selling. And mm -hmm. I just wanted to make sure I you know, explored diversity and what that felt like. And yeah, that's, this is why that's my favorite spread. It's so visual. I like the uh, the guy with the beard. You know, he just got a, like a little swipe. <laughs> you know, he just got to move. Yeah, <laughs> Is it like somebody I, you probably he, know and have seen. <laughs> yeah, he had like I thought about my brother when I was illustrating him because my brother <laughs> kind of goes yeah. about life and does his own thing. Uh, and also just. Uh, putting in a black male, I just felt like that was important for me because like it like seeing them and even at a farmer's market or in these types of environments, it's just like, I don't know, I just think of like creating safety for us all and how we envision people, where they can show up. That's and right. sometimes it feels like it's not okay to be in certain places, but I just want to be like, it is okay. Like all these types of people can be here. That's right. You do have different faces, you know. And, uh, multiple um, cultures and races there. You see little doggy, everybody's got a doggy. Mm -hmm. A little guy at the fish stand, you know, he's got his fresh fish. And then the, uh, the little stand with the um, the daisies. You yeah, there's, like a, there's some flowers. I yeah. think I have jam, pickles. Oh. <laughs> 
Mm. The lady yeah. with the turban on. Just so visual, as is the rest of the book. So I would uh, truly, truly um, recommend that anybody who would have the opportunity would, would pick that up for themselves as well as uh, one of their children. And uh, we talked about Layla and the illustrations and all that, but what, what is Layla's, Layla's happiness about? What's the book about itself? So, um, so the book is about a girl, her name's Layla, she's seven years old. And the first line in the book is, my name's Layla, I'm seven years old. Uh, Layla means night beauty and I love the night. And then it goes into all the things that she finds joy in in her life. And it's very, it's written as a poem by, um, we call her Akira, <laughs> by Akira. And it's just kind of like the simple joys in life. And what I love is that uh, I feel like it teaches just like, you know, you can find joy and contentment in the little things. And that kind of is what centers and grounds us. And beyond that is extra, but you know, we kind of just get to highlight these small things in this little girl's life. Yeah, and that's still in keeping with um, a snowy day. Another little boy, just enjoy a snowy day, a beautiful day. Yeah. So um, do you have any advice yourself for those who are starting out as illustrators and uh, want to work with children's books or other media? Yeah, so I think I just have like maybe two or three things. Um, so I went to VCU and at VCU, they always told us to keep a journal, um, like, or a sketchbook on us. Like whether it was like, we call, they're called moleskins is what we liked at our school, but any type of sketchbook, just so you can always be drawing and practicing and collecting references. And then I went, one of my professors, um, he uh, gave us this uh, presentation on the value of your personal insight. And that's how, that'll kind of, that's like the start to your success, I think. So I just wanna say like that all, that um, that presentation stuck with me because I said there's, it, your insight is important, your story's valid, it's important. And what you have to say is worth um, being on whatever platform you see it on. So whether that's in a children's book, on in a film you know wherever you see it like uh trust your story and what you have to say um and yeah i think that's my those are the two things i'd say okay thank you so much i'm gonna um turn to your contact page ashley corinne illustration mm -hmm. and be found at www ashleycorin.com. Yes, um, my work can be found there. Um, and then you can, I'm also on Instagram and you can send me a message also. So everything can be done there. Okay, and I did peek at your uh, webpage and it is beautiful, it's awesome. So oh, thank you. a lot of information there. So um, are you doing other works or do yeah. you have? Mm -hmm. So I have. Mm -hmm. So I have um, in the past, so I started pursuing all of this full time in 2021. And since then, I've been able to publish or have 10 books published. Some are board books. Um, I think I have like four board books and the rest are other store, you know, um, long form books, I guess I forget the name of them. But um, and then in March, uh, I just illustrated a book for Mary J. Blige, the singer. And so, yeah, so that's like, that's been um, exciting. Well, we'll see what comes of that. And if nothing, it's fine. But uh, that is an accomplishment and I'm, yeah. I'm excited about. And so, yeah, that'll come out in March and you can pre-order it now. Um, and that's called Mary Can. Hmm, Mary Can. Yes. Oh. It's a good story. <laughs> it's another positive message book. Um, yeah. And that one's about when people are telling you no um, yeah. and just giving yourself that encouragement that, yes, you can do the things that you hope mm. to do. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so um, what I'm going to do now is check our chat room to see if there are any questions for either of you. 
Let's see. Someone mentioned, uh, well, we'll start out. Start. Mm -hmm. Leah said hello, and she was happy to join when she came in. That's Laurie's sister. Uh, and Angela Davidson, AHA Zone, said thank you, Laurie, and congratulations. Uh, and then uh, you thanked her for the opportunity. And then someone mentioned that they have a copy of a snow day. As a matter of fact, when I was talking to my girlfriend who has the grandchildren who got so excited to receive the book, she said that she had read a snowy day to them. So we know that that's a very popular uh, book uh, for children and it's been well received and will continue to be well received. So at this point, I want to again, thank you both so much for joining us today. It has truly been exciting um, just to come, whoops, excuse me, looks like two more messages. Thank you both, okay, from Karen White, yes. From Harolyn Brown, I mean Bland, I'm sorry, cousin. Congratulations, congratulations to both of you. I'm pleased to see more books that represent people of color. And thank you for sharing your talents. And again, I thank you both for joining us and for taking the time out of your busy schedules and I just uh, think it's such a blessing uh, to, to have spoken to you both and to gotten some insight from you from the perspective of an author and an illustrator. And that you're both so articulate and you present it so well. And you are um, doing great things in the areas that you choose as artists. So again, I just thank you both so very, very much. Let's see what else my note says. <laughs> yeah, I was just like, noting about Leah's happiness. That is, you know, just a wonderful story. It's filled with joy and fun, making people happy and, you know, about feeling secure, secure little girl. So again, I want to congratulate you both and thank you for joining us here in this presentation today. We hope to see you both again. And as for next month, uh, which is Black History Month, on the second Tuesday at one o'clock, uh, February 14th, a dear friend of ours, uh, NAAHA, Robin Fields, who is from the historic Erectortown, Virginia. She'll come on on that day and uh, talk about um, African-American history as it relates to the town of Erectortown and what it was like for her to grow up in Rectortown uh, during the, um, primarily the 50s and 60s. So we're excited about that. And she'll um, um, give some insight from her perspective of the um, Black History Month theme, which is resistance. So it has to do with Black resistance. So I hope you all join us. Uh, I'm sure it'll be very educational and a, a good experience, a worthwhile one. And then on Tuesday, the 28th, uh, we will be visited by Darlene Green, who is the church clerk of Mount Morris Baptist Church in Hume. She was with us last year to share some of um, her genealogy. And she's gonna return this time to talk to us about collecting church historical records and maintaining accurate and efficient um, church records. So um, I'm looking forward with excitement to both of them as well. So again, we thank you for joining us today and we look forward to seeing you again next month. And thanks again so much, Lori and Ashley. And uh, bless you both in your future endeavors. Thank you so much. Okay, signing up. Thank you. Bye. Bye now. <laughs>